and join us to talk with John Ablon, who is the co-editor of this newest book, Deadline Artists, America's Greatest Newspaper Columns. Mr. Ablon, where'd you get the idea to put this together? Uh, this was the book I wanted to read. It was the book that we wanted to read. Um, Errol Lewis and I were working at the New York Sun together as, as young columnists, and we started talking to our colleagues, like Jack Newfield, who was uh, the late, great Jack Newfield, and sort of saying, what are your favorite columns? What are your favorite columnists? And uh, he and, and Jimmy Breslin, his friend, both picked the same one, called The Death of Frankie Jerome by Westbrook Pegler. It hadn't been anthologized since 1924. And it took us weeks to find. And, and so Jesse Angelo, our co-editor and friend who's at the New York Post, we all began this process. But at the end of the day, this was a labor of love. It was an education. It was an inspiration. But it, it followed the rule I think you should follow when you're putting a book together. You should write the book you want to read. And this well, is what we want to do. John read. Avalon, who is your favorite newspaper columnist of all time? You have to have one. If, if I had to pick one, uh, I'd probably pick Jimmy Breslin. Why? Um, Breslin is like like the greats, um, and Mike Royko's in this camp, and Murray Kempton, uh, Pete Hamill, who'll be with us later today. They can hit any pitch. They they don't write in one genre. You know, Ernie Pyle is justly the, the patron saint of, of newspaper columnists. He's the GI journalist, died in battle a year after receiving the Pulitzer. But Jimmy Breslin could hit any pitch, and he's still with us. And that's a remarkable thing. He recently resumed his column at the Daily News. But you read Breslin back in the 60s. And, and 70s, and you appreciate the guy's range, the way he can bring humor to almost any situation, the way he can write about crime, civil rights, war. Um, uh, you know, we divided the book thematically uh, war, politics, sports, uh, humor, crime, civil rights. But Breslin can have, could have columns in all of those sections, and that's what the greats do. Mike Royko could as well, so could Murray Kempton, H.L. Mencken. What kind of power did Walter Lippmann have? Walter Lippmann was really kind of the, the dean of the American Century School of Columnists. He was uh, a really a, a, a great proponent of what we call in the book the Mount Olympus column, where, where the, the author analyst sort of comes down from the mountain and says, I've analyzed our problems and here's what you should do. It's a very tempting role for columnists to play. Interestingly, those columns don't tend to age as well as the storytellers. And part of what we're trying to do in this book, you know, we're writing at a time when people are writing obituaries for newspapers every day. But opinion writing is proliferating online like never before. And, and what's unique about these columns, and what I think really makes a column last, in addition to great writing, is great storytelling and a reported column, talking to people, not just talking about ideas or typing out your opinions. My favorite Lippmann column is, however, not that. It's a column he wrote after the death of Amelia Earhart. And it's a beautiful piece of work. It's really a meditation about the pioneering spirit and why she felt obligated to fly and to keep on you know, pushing herself to make new records, and one of which she lost her life on. It's about that pioneering American spirit, and it's beautiful, and it can be read today and give you chills. Was there a time, and is there a time now, that newspaper columnists had the power to change policy? Yes. Yeah, certainly that was Walter Lippmann's reputation back in the Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson era. Uh, when Lippmann broke with Vietnam, Johnson felt personally wounded. Um, and, and, and you do see that there's, you know, the, the American newspaper column evolved over time. It didn't spring wholesale. You know, the earliest examples we have are Ben Franklin writing as Poor Richard. You see Mark Twain, Ambrose Bierce. Um, actually, the earliest American columnist, as we understand today, is a woman named Fanny Fern, who wrote right around the 1850s, 60s, and 70s for the New York Ledger, writing a regular column under a pen name, which she was buried under, incidentally. Uh, but, but, you know, you see columns hit their peak of influence beginning around 1890 with Richard Harding Davis, who really creates the myth of Theodore Roosevelt by chronicling his, march, uh, his charge up San Juan Hill, um, and, and really sets a model that people like Hemingway would follow, you know, that, that globe-trotting journalist who's a figure in his own right. Um, but the, the, the apex of columnists in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, these folks had a direct impact on policy, whether they were railing from the outside or advising people from within. Page 47, Pete Hamill's column from 9-12-2001, yeah. Death Takes Hold Among the Living. Why is this included in your book of the best columns? This is a great example of why we call the book Deadline Artists. Um, at the end of the day, this is an American art form. It is a creative uh, process, and and it is written under deadline. Um, you know, Pete Hamill wrote that column on 9/11. He writes it from the perspective of being 
downtown. Uh, blocks away when the planes hit the World Trade Center and the Trade Center collapsed, and it details his day. It's history written in the present tense. That's one of the things a deadline artist does. And you see it again and again when Jimmy Breslin is writing the column after John Lennon's assassination called Are You John Lennon? He write, John Lennon is shot in the early evening. He files by 11 p.m. He interviews the cops who take Lennon's body from the Dakota to the Roosevelt Hospital where he dies. He drilled that out in just one or two or three hours. That's a deadline artist. You create something transcendent in a disposable medium. And Pete Hamill's column is a great example of it. Deadline artist is the book. Yeah. Phone numbers are 202-624-1111 for those of you in the East and Central time zones, 202-624-1115 for the Mountain and Pacific time zones. John Avlon is one of the co-editors. Who are your other co-editors? Jesse Again? Angelo and Errol Lewis were all uh, dear friends. Jesse and I grew up in New York together. He's the editor-in-chief of The Daily, the first, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, 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 online periodical just specifically for the iPad. Uh, and also executive editor of the New York Post. And Errol Lewis uh, is the anchor of New York One News now in New York, an inside City Hall program, but was a columnist with me at the New York Sun and then at the Daily News. John Avalon, local papers and local columnists, yeah. how important are they today? They are not as important as they should be to the great detriment of the newspaper industry. Um, what you saw is that there are columnists who define the spirit of their city. Mike Royko for Chicago. When Mike Royko died, they held his memorial service in Wrigley Field. That's how beloved he was by the community and how much he defined his times. Mike Barnacle in Boston defined Boston for in that time he was writing for the Boston Globe in the 80s and 90s. Jimmy Breslin, Murray Kempton. Um, and I think one of the things that's happened with, that led to the decline of newspaper, it wasn't simply the rise of online. It was as newspapers became homogenized, they started cutting their local voices. Uh, and, and, and then you start to lose the soul of the paper. At the end of the day, I think columnists are the soul of the paper. They're an important reason why people buy a paper. You know, a great sports columnist, and many of the greatest columnists are sports columnists, Grantland Rice, Red Smith, uh, you know, Shirley Povich, these folks didn't just tell you who won or lost the game. They told you what happened behind the scenes. And, and that's what a great columnist does. It puts current events in context. It gives you a sense of perspective. It's great storytelling. And a local columnist gives you that sense of place. And when that gets lost, papers become less essential. Uh, and I think that's a real one of the challenges newspapers are going to have going forward as they try to reclaim their identity. I think it's to double down on their local identity and elevate new local voices who create that loyalty and that sense of place that invigorates a paper. Who is Damon Runyon? Damon Runyon. Runyon is really one of the classics. I mean, he's another one of these guys who could hit any pitch. He's represented in the book, in this, in this column, Murder in the Worst Degree, in the crime section. But he's got another column in Humor called uh, Where Death Plays a Social Call, where the Grim Reaper visits his house. He just wants to socialize because he doesn't feel like anybody likes him. And David Runyon says, shoo, get out of here. No one wants you around here. Um, the, the, you know, the, the play and later movie guy, and short story, Guys and Dolls, came out of Runyon's columns. Uh, Runyon is really one of the early progenitors of that kind of the mythic American newspaper columnist. H.L. Mencken also played that role. Um, he's in the book. Um, and, 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 but Runyon, you just get a sense of his range, and it's a joy. Would an H.L. Mencken, would an H. L. Mencken um, be read outside of Baltimore? Yes. I mean, he was classically, he was the Baltimore Sun columnist. But, you know, his famous columns, um, you know, the Scopes Monkey Trial, which is in the book, where he chronicles that great debate over evolution, uh, which becomes the basis for the play and then the movie Inherit the Wind, where his role is played by Gene Kelly, thinly, thinly disguised. That's a national figure. And, and the point about these columns, we didn't want to just give people great reading. But this is literary journalism. And, and the average length of a column is 850 words. You can read it on the go. You can read it on a commute. You can read it before you go to bed. But the relevance is amazing. There's enduring wisdom. You know, if you're concerned about the rise of conservative populism today, you read H.L. Mencken on the Scopes Monkey Trial, and you see how much what's old is new. It's like Harry Truman said, you know, the only thing new in the world is the history you don't know. And that's one of the things that it's John Avalon, shows. what's your day, day job? I'm a columnist for Newsweek and the Daily Beast and a CNN contributor. And also author of Wingnuts, How yes. the Lunatic Fringe <laughs> is Hijacking America. This is a co-edited book, Deadline Artists. And James in Scranton, PA, you're on Book TV. James. Hello. Hello. Hey, James. 
Okay, James, James. Please go ahead with your question or comment. Hello. The reason I'm calling, I'd like to find out uh, what's your favorite uh, uh, Jimmy Breslin column. And uh, my favorite if it is, Jimmy Breslin column. Go, go ahead, James. Finish your book, your question. And, and if it is, uh, if it is uh, about the death of women, he seems to be uh, a little detached. A little what? A little detached from the, the he was an Irish okay. American and this guy was in a, a Brit. James, what is your favorite Jimmy Breslin column? Right. Okay, James, we'll leave it there. Uh, and just a my, reminder to our viewers, turn down the volume on your TV when you call in. My, my favorite Jimmy Breslin column is probably a death in emergency room one, uh, where Breslin's work after the JFK assassination is instrumental. It's important because he zigs when other people zags. He famously interviewed the grave digger for JFK in a column called It's an Honor. But in Death Emergency Room 1, he interviews the attending room physician who's on duty at the Dallas hospital that day. And, and he recreates his day. The president comes in, is given last rites, um, and, and with uh, the first lady standing, uh, never crying, just in the back of the room. The last line of the piece is, I never saw a president before. Uh, but the piece for John, John Lennon is also a, a, a beautiful piece of work. We're in Miami. Carl Hyacin is well known down here. Is he in the book? He absolutely is. And Carl Hyacin is one of the very best writing today. It, it's important to appreciate that this is not just a tribute to the best of the past, but we go to present day. And the art of the reported column, these people who can hit any pitch, Carl Hyacin is a great example. He is a humorist. He writes about crime. He writes about politics. Um, he is unflinching. He is funny. Uh, and uh, he's, he's one of the very, very best writing today. Next and Leonard Pitts, also from Miami. Great columnist. Next call for John Avlon comes from Parkersburg, West Virginia. Hi, Carrie. Go ahead. Hi. I am fascinated by the journalists of the late 19th, early 20th century. The writing was so vibrant, so real. Some of the reporting, especially from the First World War, is maybe some of the greatest writing I've ever read. I read something incredible. Um, it was a writer, I believe, uh, an American writer who went to an Austrian hospital before, of course, the U.S. entered the war. Some of the most moving writing I've ever, ever read about any wartime experience. And I wondered if you mentioned any of those writers, and especially John Reed, uh, the impact he had. I remember one column I read by John Reed, and I'm not sure um, when he wrote this, he was just speaking about the Romanians and saying different things about that country. I know he also uh, was involved with the reporting in, the Mex in Mexico. It just seemed that, that reporters before the age of radio, especially, just seemed so much bolder, so much more opinionated. I think we think of today's writers as being opinionated, but to me, they were even more so. Thank you. Hey, Carrie, Carrie, tell us where your interest in newspaper columnists came from. Uh, what was that, sir? Car uh, Carrie, tell us where your interest in newspaper columnists came from. Well, I'm a writer. All Thank right. you very much. <laughs> well, Carrie, uh, first of all, you make a great macro point about the role of technology. You read <laughs> columnists. This was apparent when we were putting the, the book together. Um, the columnists who were writing, especially before the advent of television, um, there was a greater burden of proof, in effect, for them to make a scene come alive in the mind's eye. They, were, they wrote much more vivid, descriptive writing uh, because they were compensating for that lack of, a sort of lazy uh, lack of, uh, of, of an impulse we have today where people, we, we can make a reference and know that someone will have an image in their mind. These days, in the past, they didn't do it. John Reed is a great example, J uh, Jack London. These are folks who wrote really long like, like features as opposed to columns. Again, it's an evolving process that we had to cut a lot of folks from the book and already we're beginning a conversation about doing a second volume because we're having people saying, this is great, but did you think about this or that? Um, Richard Harding Davis, who I mentioned earlier, he talks about uh, the, 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 uh, the, the long gray march of German soldiers into Belgium at the uh, start of World War I and it's a, it's a harrowing moment. Are there columnists who bird dog an issue? Sure, sure. I mean, that's one of the great hallmarks. You know, you, you keep hammering away at an issue. I mean, uh, Carl Rowan wrote a great series on, on corruption inside the NAACP uh, where he really prosecuted that argument. Um, you see it certainly, Murray Kempton's work on the, civil, the early civil rights era 
uh, where he's writing from Mississippi in the 50s and early 60s is unbelievably evocative. Uh, and he, he just kept telling that story. And he did it with a, 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 a kindness, right? He, he, would, he would let people hang themselves. They didn't, they didn't indulge in, in, in polemics. He would treat even a bigot with a degree of dignity, but put his words and let them speak for him uh, and, uh, and, and really tell the story of that, of that movement. Um, and, and look, it is, a, it is a, an evolving thing today. You think about the way Tom Friedman writes, has been a prophet of globalization. You talk about David Brooks, Peggy Noonan's work after 9-11, some of the most beautiful writing. Um, Steve Lopez you know, had a series of columns that ended up into the movie The Soloist. He writes for the LA Times now, a classic example of, of the reported column enduring in today's work. One of the very best. Here is the cover of the book. It's called Deadline Artists. Our next call comes from right here in Florida. David in Hope Sound, Florida. Did I get it right? You got it right this time. Good for you, David. <laughs> uh, Peter, right, I should David. say. Uh, I wanted to say that I became, became interested in columnists by reading the old New York Post of the 1950s and yeah. 60s, and that you had some great ones there. Murray Kempton, you mentioned. Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes yes. wrote a column for the uh, New York Post. And I learned quite a bit about the black community from uh, that column. And uh, it, you're right, uh, but you know, the New York Post, I think, went down because it was t columnist heavy. And uh, I don't think that Dor even Dorothy Schiff's fortune could sustain it. So we <laughs> lost a lot when uh, finally, and uh, excuse me, James Wexler, don't forget him. And I'm not a liberal mm -hmm. anymore, but nonetheless, uh, I have to say that uh, from those uh, people, I learned quite a bit about mm -hmm. the various uh, communities uh, in New York City, and uh, I'm grateful to them. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, you know, the New York Post back in the day had an unbelievable roster. You know, Murray Kempton, Pete Hamill, who's here today, um, and, and so many others. You know, it, it, uh, certainly the Herald Tribune was a celebrated paper. Um, and, and, and one of the things that this book has done, it's allowed us to uncover columnists who are unjustly part forgotten today. Dorothy Thompson, hugely influential in the 1930s, an early warner about the rise of Hitler, railing against Hitler and, and the Munich Accords. Um, you had, you know, Hayward Brune, a beautiful writer who could also hit any pitch. Uh, Westbrook Pegler, um, likewise. Uh, you know, they, these papers really did put forward rosters like, like Murder's Row, you know. They put forward their columnists like, like the heart of a ball club. And, and the, they were the home run hitters, and they were explicitly referred to that way. You know, if you watch Citizen Kane, he hires the opposing paper's great columnists to compete. That's what people look for. That's the personality of the paper, the soul of the paper. And, and these were literary journalists, and that provided a lot of the value. Could a columnist get a president on the phone? Yeah, yeah. Certainly, you mentioned Walter Lippmann. He could. James Reston was enormously respected. The caller mentioned Reston. Reston uh, has a great column in called uh, Touring Dixie with LBJ, where he talks about Johnson selling civil rights, uh, vaunting the, uh, crossing the Appalachians like Andy Jackson in a jetliner. You know, great, vivid writing about that sale. You know, um, uh, you know Molly Ivins, I don't know if she can get a president on the phone, but she continued that tradition of the enthusiasm for politics. Uh, and, and again, her range was, was remarkable. One of the things we try to do in politics is it, it's a civic conversation, and we try to make sure folks from left, right, and center were all represented. You know, William F. Buckley next to Molly Ivins, next to Hayward Brune, next to H.L. Uh, Mencken. The idea being that one of the things I think we're in danger of losing with the rise of partisan media is you get polemics. You get people preaching to their respective choir. And the great columnists, they, you would read them and enjoy them and appreciate them, even if you didn't agree with their politics because you appreciated the elegance of their argument. And I think that's still true with people like Peggy Noonan today. Uh, but it was definitely true with Buckley and, and, and others. And that's the kind of, I think, civic, constructive civic conversation that columnists can spur. Unless I overlooked it, I did not see Paul Krugman in here. Well, you can't have everyone. We had to cut the book in half, in fact. Um, and there are judgment calls. And we knew that the contemporary columnists in particular we wanted to be leaner on. Because we wanted this to be a, a tribute to the greatest columnists of the past. The vast majority of these columns you can't find online. And that was one of the things that spurred us to put this together. We thought a book like this would exist. And, and there had been some efforts at doing compilations, but nothing 
you know, that in our sense was this comprehensive and that was organized thematically, and that's why we put this book together. These things are they're moldering on microfilm. They're lost in libraries, and 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 you know, for those of us who do our research online, as many contemporary columnists do and people at home, you can fall into this lull that history began around 1996. And some greats are available, but many, many more are not. And that was part of the urgency of putting this book together to begin that appreciation, to begin that conversation. And we hope one of the things that emerges is, you know, all of Jimmy Breslin's books should be in print. You know, we want to start a, an appreciation for this American art form. Scott in Yonkers, New York. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Uh, John, yes, um, you just mentioned Jimmy Breslin, who is, um, he's always been a big hero to me, and he's one of my favorite columnists. And uh, I also, my other, a couple of my other favorites are Bob Herbert and Jim Dwyer from the New York Times. Yeah. And one thing that the, the three of them have in common, they all did a great job of documenting uh, the racism of Bob Grant, the uh, radio host in New York City on, on WABC. Yeah. I think he's still, he's still on there. And they, they wrote many times about the connections between Bob Grant and Rudolph Giuliani, who you used to work for. And, uh, and they wrote about how racist Giuliani was for never condemning now, Bob Grant. Now, hold on. I'm not going to let no, you go. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. Just because it's Very racist, quickly. Finish up your you comments, Scott. Of the call. Um, he was, uh, Giuliani was a filthy, filthy racist. And why did you never get Giuliani to try to disassociate himself from Bob Grant, who used to call Martin Luther we King? You got the Scott? point, Scott. Thank you very much. All right. Mr. First Avalon, of all, your Bob Grant has his own zip code. I'm not a fan. Rudy Giuliani, when I worked for him, had nothing to do with Bob Grant. I'm offended that this person would throw around a word like racism and apply it ignorantly to Rudy Giuliani. Um, people can have disagreements. Uh, you know, we should. We can have. We can have disagreements without demonizing each other. And I think that caller did just that. But you mentioned Bob Herbert. You know, we have a great column of Bob Herbert's in the book called A Fool's Errand. Um, and, and we saw Bob, one of the big questions, are you picking the right column? Uh, and, uh, and he said that that indeed had been one of his favorites. And I actually want to get back to something one of the previous caller mentioned. Langston Hughes wrote a column for two decades for the Chicago Defender. One of the great things about this book we discovered wasn't just the great columnists of the past who've been, you know, in danger of being forgotten, but these celebrated American figures who were columnists before they became novelists or playwrights, like Langston Hughes, like O. Henry, whose short stories began in embryo when he was writing a column for the Houston Post Chronicle, um, like Hunter S. Thompson wrote a column for a time for the San Francisco Examiner, uh, like Pete Dexter wrote columns for years before he became a celebrated novelist, an unbelievably great columnist. Um, so, and even Orson Welles, the director, wrote a column, a syndicated column for a time. Uh, Woody Guthrie, the great uh, protest singer, wrote a column. So part of it is rediscovering these personalities uh, and, and that, that they were all part of this vibrant American conversation. Last call for our guest, John Avalon, comes from Larry in Newport Beach, California. Hi, Larry. Uh, hello there. I was just wondering if uh, Jim Murray is <coughs> included in the, uh, in the uh, <coughs> contents of the book. Who's you, that? Who's that? Jim Murray? Oh, yes. Jim no, Murray. Yes. Jim yes. Murray, L.A. Times. Okay. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you brought Jim Murray up because we haven't spoken a lot about sports columnists or humor columnists. Um, they are two of the great genres. Humor columns actually be, were the earliest form of column. They were side by side with the editorial. And, and, and it's a tradition we've sort of lost. But you go back to Mark Twain and Ambrose Bierce, Dave Barry being a master of the form here out of Miami when he was writing for the Herald. Um, people like Russell Baker. I mean, these are enormously influential. And the great thing about humor columnists in particular um, is that, you know, it's what we've learned from John Stewart and Stephen Colbert today. Sometimes satire is the best way to tell the truth. Sports columnists are some of the greatest columnists. They've mastered the art of the lead. You go back and read Grantland Rice, Red Smith on, on Bobby Thompson's shot heard round the world, Shirley Povich on uh, Iron Horse Breaks when Lou Gehrig pronounced himself the luckiest man in the world, Jim Murray in the L.A. Times, uh, so many others. Great sports columnists really captured the form, and it's one of the best parts of the book, one of my favorites. Deadline Artist is published by Overlook Press. What's that picture on the front, John Avalon? It's an old school man at a typewriter smoking a cigarette. We wanted to go for sort of a 
noir uh, McSorley's feel. We, this is this is all about classic Americana, lost art with a bit of a was noir this a street. post photo or no 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 I, 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 you know they, it was a, a cover designer who did it, but he caught the feel. We want this to be the book, you know, what people have in their mind's eye about that classic independent reporter, kind of that literary private eye working on their own, evoking a, a classic Americana, something that endures today, that spirit. That's what we want to move forward. It's a challenge to our generation to really up our game when we learn about the best of the past. It's like jazz musicians always listen to the musicians of the past. Uh, that's in one of the ways that this book is. We wanted to pay tribute to the best of the past, and really it's a challenge for us going forward to keep that spirit of the reported column alive. And, and you're going to be joining a couple of columnists up in Chapman Hall here at Miami-Dade College in just right. a minute. Who's going to be on the panel it's with you? It's going to be the great Pete Hamill, who you mentioned earlier, uh, and Mike Barnacle, um, uh, two really of the greats, classic deadline artists. We're going to have a conversation about the art of column writing. And really looking forward to it. And, and Errol Lewis. And that will be live on booktv.org. You can watch the live webcast online booktv.org, and that's in about 15 minutes or so you'll be able to watch that. John Avalon, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you very much. Well, we've got one more call-in segment coming up, and that is this book, Jim Rassenberger's The Brilliant